All right, we are all set up. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our Ask a Scientist segment with the Asheville Museum of Science. My name is Abby, and this morning we have with us Miss Carly Jackson. She is a master's student in Florida at Nova, Nova Southeastern University, and she does lots of interesting work. She's uh, worked in Belize for uh, a short time uh, studying tourism effects on nurse sharks. She has been working at a, non a nonprofit called the Gumbo Limbo Nature Center in, in Florida where she works as a marine turtle specialist. And she has tons of really awesome experiences, photos and information to share with us this morning. So I'm really excited. Carly, welcome and you can take it away. Awesome, thanks Abby. Um, so as Abby said, my name is Carly Jackson. I am a marine turtle specialist and a grad student down here in South Florida. Um, and I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about sharks and sea turtles, my favorite animals and the animals that I do work with. Um, so if it's all right with you, Abby, I'll get started. With Absolutely. And I do, I do want to remind uh, the audience really quick one thing. Um, so Carly has, is actually a co-founder as well. I forgot my little intro. Carly is a co-founder of MISS, which is Minorities in Shark Sciences. And she works with, she co-founded this with a group of women who are really working to promote mentorship, inclusion, diversity in the sciences and specifically in the shark and marine sciences. Um, I will attach their website to their, our Facebook link later so you guys can check it out. Um, she does a lot of really cool work and ha uh, there are some scholarship opportunities for minority students that definitely are are valuable and really interesting so i'll share that but now you can now you can take it away Carly. Awesome. yeah i'll talk more about this at the end so that's some really exciting work that i've just started um so i'm going to start sharing my screen let's see if this works oh, all right here we go all right can you see it Sweet. All right, guys. So <clears throat> like I said a little earlier, my name is Carly Jackson. I'm a master's uh, in science candidate at Nova Southeastern University. I'm going to be talking to you guys about um, my experiences in the marine biology world. I'll talk about sharks and sea turtles and more if you guys have questions about other little critters. Um, so yeah, let's get started. <clears throat> So first off, I'll say that I do work at a place called Gumbo Limbo Nature Center. It's a funny name, but Gumbo Limbo is actually a type of tree that's very popular here in uh, South Florida. So it's located in Boca Raton, Florida, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I do there, but just a brief summary. I work on the beaches of Boca Raton and I mark all of the sea turtle nests. I also work in the sea turtle hospital that we have as well. Um, and like I said a little earlier, I'm a graduate student at Nova Southeastern University, working directly in the CMED lab, uh, which stands for Conservation, Movement, and Ecosystem Dynamics. It's a mouthful. That's why we just call it CMED. <laughs> and there I um, work with, I do some shark tagging that contributes to a lot of different research at our school. Um, and I'll also talk about my thesis project, which was looking at the effects of tourism on nurse sharks. So just a brief overview of what we're going to be, what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, first, I'm going to start talking about sharks, what they are, why they're important, and then I'll go into some of my research and the work that I do. Uh, then I'm going to talk about sea turtles, uh, sea turtles in specific specific, not just turtles. <laughs> um, and I'll start off talking about the work that I do at Gumbo Limbo, um, then go into what are sea turtles, the different types that we see here. And then I'll go into some fun nesting facts. So that's always fun. <laughs> so what is a shark? A lot of people think that shark aren't fish, but they are a type of fish. So um, they're a type of fish called elasmobranchs, which that's just a family um, of animals that have cartilaginous skeletons. So that's a very big word. But basically, if you feel your nose or if you like bend your ears a little, that's what that uh, type of bone is called car cartilage. There we go. Cartilage is in your near ears and your nose. Um, it's very flexible. And sharks and rays, they are, their entire skeleton is made of that material. So that's where, that's where we get the name elasmobranch. So all elasmobranchs have cartilage 
skeletons. Um, so that's pretty cool. It makes them really flexible. So sharks and rays are cousins. Um, they all are in the same family. Rays are just a little bit more flat bodied and their mouths and their gills are at the bottom of their body while regular or just sharks, their mouths are usually in front of their heads and their gills are on the sides of their heads. So the, that's really the big difference between um, sharks and rays. And then um, Abby, I uh, actually, I think I could, I could pull up the chat. Never mind. I've got the chat just in case people have got questions. Cool. All right, so um, I'll go into the difference between sharks, which are cartilaginous fish, and then regular bony fish, just to give you guys a good idea of um, what's really the big difference between them. So the first difference you can see is in the gill slits. So fish, they usually just have one gill slit, just like this little uh, schoolmaster snapper right here. And then uh, sharks usually have about five to seven gill slits. So you'll see they have multiple gill slits. Um, and this, the gills are what is what helps them with breathing, similar to our lungs. So they just, uh, they help, they take the oxygen that's in water and moves it through the body of the shark. Just the same way we, we breathe air and it goes through our bodies and gives us energy and all that good stuff. Same thing with sharks. It's typical to find most sharks with five gills. Um, anything more than five gills are usually, there's literally names for sharks called six gill shark and the seven gill shark. So very creative names there. <laughs> but most sharks do have uh, five gill slits. Another interesting difference between sharks and uh, regular bony fish are their scales. So if you guys look at fish scales, um, if you've ever touched a fish when you go fishing, you'll see some of their scales kind of come off on your hands and they're really thin. Um, they're also sometimes like very reflective and they're in this really nice smooth pattern down the uh, fish's body. But on sharks, their scales are actually made out of teeth. So the name for shark skin is dermal denticles, which quite literally translates to teeth skin. And I will say that I think that's one of the first facts I learned about sharks when I was younger. And that's what got me hooked on sharks because who has teeth for skin? Like, of course, sharks have teeth for skin. <laughs> They've just got teeth all over their body. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so dermal denticles are pretty cool. They actually help the sharks stay uh, hydrodynamic. So that helps them swim a lot faster and move through the water a lot smoother. Um, and if you've ever touched a shark, like in an aquarium touch tank or something, if you touch going from the head to the tail, it's very smooth because that's the uh, direction all the dermal denticles are pointing. But if you turn or if you uh, feel them from the tail to the head, actually feels like sandpaper. It's not going to like cut your hands or anything, but it does feel like sandpaper because these are microscopic teeth. These aren't like things that you just regularly see. Like as soon as you look at a shark, you just see teeth all over its, um, all over its skin. But yes, it does feel like sandpaper. Good question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the teeth skin definitely blew my mind when I first uh, when I first learned about it because that is the picture that you guys see right here is literally a microscopic image of um, shark skin. So some a lot of different like this isn't what all types of shark skin looks like, but this is the basic um, layout. So it's going to have pointy looking teeth on its skin. It might be different shapes for different types of sharks because certain sharks are more um, are more specialized for swimming super fast or some sharks might be more specialized for just sitting at the bottom and being really lazy. So, um, but yeah, their teeth skin comes in all different shapes and sizes. <laughs> all right, so why are sharks important? A lot of people, when they think of sharks, they think of like jaws or like anything crazy um, with sharks eating people. Hold on here a second. Why do sharks have more gills than other fish? Okay, I will go into that real quick before I go into the why sharks are important. So sharks are a lot more, um, they're a lot bigger than most other fish and they're a lot more specialized than most other fish. So they're uh, having more gill slits 
helps them, you know, get more oxygen into their body. Um, and it's also just a specialized feature for sharks. It's a evolutionary trait and I can't place my mind on the exact um, evolutionary advantage that sharks have with the multiple gill slits. But um, so I can't like directly answer your question. But the first thing that comes to mind is that they're bigger animals. They're a lot more specialized in general than a lot of different fish. So multiple gill slits help them um, move that oxygen through their body and take the oxygen out of the water a whole lot easier than just one gill slit. So. Awesome. All right. Good question. So why are sharks important? Like I said, a lot of people think of jaws or people getting eaten by sharks and sharks just need to be killed because they are just eating everyone. Well, that's actually not really true. Um, sharks are super, super, super important in a whole ocean balance system. Um, the whole ecosystem of our ocean depends on sharks. They are apex predators in most of their environments. So they, do their part by keeping their prey species from overpopulating. So if a certain species that a shark is, um, that a shark preys on, if it becomes, if you remove the shark and their prey species starts overpopulating, that prey species is probably going to start um, having a lot of like adverse effects on their prey species. So for example, um, I think that there was a study done in California with like uh, otters. So a lot of the otters were fished to almost extinction for their fur. And because of that, the otters prey, which are, uh, I think it's like sea urchins, something like that, sea urchins, they just overpopulated on a kelp, the kelp forest. And since the, uh, since the uh, urchins were in overpopulation, they just ate all the kelp because there were just way too many sea urchins. So those otters weren't there to keep the uh, sea urchins in check, to keep the population in check. So same thing happens with sharks. If we remove sharks, a lot of different, uh, the, a lot of different like fish species are probably going to overpopulate or other species that have um, effects on like coral or algae or even like seagrass and things like that. All that stuff is going to just get thrown into uh, imbalance. So sharks, if sharks are in a reef, usually those reefs are pretty healthy and um, very pretty or yeah, very just visually pretty. So if you come to a reef and there's not a lot of sharks and usually since reefs are shark habitats, you should probably sh see at least one shark when you go to a reef to snorkel. <laughs> um, and usually if you don't, those reefs are not in the best shape and it's probably because sharks aren't there to keep everything he healthy. Um, and another thing that they do is they, uh, a lot of people think sharks are like, they go after like all the, they love the chase of the prey. Sharks really like to conserve their energy. <laughs> and I won't call them lazy, but they usually will go on the sick and unhealthy uh, animals. So that's why you always hear like, if there's a fish that's lagging behind all the other fish or like a seal that's lagging behind all the other seals, that's usually the seal that's gonna become breakfast for the shark. <laughs> um, so yeah, so for any variety of reasons, those fish or those marine mammals that they uh, prey on, they could have a disease or just overall be unhealthy. And they're kind of keep, the sharks are keeping that, um, preventing the spread of that disease. And since sharks aren't mammals and they usually don't get affected by the same type of like diseases that mammals or certain fish are affected by, when they eat them, it's not gonna affect them. So, um, so yeah, they, they definitely do a huge part with keeping our oceans and our reefs healthy. And another thing, a lot of people want to ask, like, how would sharks have an effect on climate, climate change, things like that. Um, and climate change is all our, just our climate in general is controlled by the ocean. <laughs> so if our oceans are health, are unhealthy um, because sharks being removed from certain, uh, certain like little ecosystems or certain niches um, that definitely can have an effect on our climate. There's not any, there's no specific research that I've, re that I've read that have like very specific, like this is what's gonna happen if we remove sharks on our plant or to our climate, this is gonna happen to our climate. But overall, we do know since sharks keep our oceans healthy, unhealthy oceans is always gonna lead to an unhealthy climate. So that is another way that sharks 
are important. So if you didn't think sharks were important before, I hope <laughs> that you think they're very important now. All right. All right, so I got a question that says, what is your favorite shark species? So I have two. Um, one is nurse sharks. So they're the ones that are usually like, they're called puppies by a lot of divers because they sit on the bottom and they'll usually come up and they're a little curious, but they're very gentle. They're gentle. All sharks are gentle, but they're like, they're, they're literally like puppies. Um, and then my second favorite shark species, really it's like the same, they're on, it's on the same level of their shark, but mako sharks to me are absolutely insane. Like they can, they've been clocked up to like 50 miles an hour swimming speed. They're one of the fastest fish in the um, whole ocean. And since I was a swimmer, <laughs> I was a division one swimmer at FAU. I just, I definitely connect with mako sharks. I just think they're really cool because they swim. They uh, they eat tuna, which I believe is like the fastest fish in the whole world. Um, and you've got to be a pretty fast shark in order to eat tuna. So yeah, those are my favorite shark species. Good questions. All right. So um, I'll go into a little bit about um, my work with sharks and shark tagging. Then I'll go into my thesis research. So at Nova Southeastern University, I help out in the, with the shark tagging crew. Um, so what we do is <clears throat> we actually take school groups out with us to help tag. So anywhere between like middle school to high schoolers, um, sometimes a little younger than middle schoolers, believe it or not. Uh, but yeah, so we take them out and we show them what we do with the tagging. We, help, we have them help with some of the um, tagging procedures. So what we do, is we set up scientific long line. So it's a type of fishing, um, but it's very, it's very shark specific and it's designed in a way that's to not harm the shark and to be very, um, you know, like less, doesn't really have an impact on the sharks at all. Um, so what we do is when we catch the sharks, we measure the sharks, we record all this data on uh, data sheets and this data is in a whole database. Uh, so we measure the sharks, and then we take fin clippings of the sharks, which is just like tiny little clip of their uh, back fin. They usually have like a tiny trailing part in the back of um, their fins. We just clip that off and we use it for um, genetic research, stable isotope research. Um, and that is stable isotopes is when you take the tissue from anything, it could be a fish, a human, uh, any type of animal, and you do some crazy chemistry and you find out what that animal's been eating. So um, that is actually really pretty cool research in my opinion. I really like that research. Um, so we take fin clippings and then we tag the shark with a unique ID tag. So what the types of tags that we use are cow tags. So um, satellite tags aren't always used on sharks. They're very expensive, <laughs> uh, but we use cow tags and they have a little number on them. So if you if you've ever like been on a farm and seen like a cow with a little earring thing, that's the type of tag that we use. So we put it on the top of their dorsal fin. Um, it has a number and basically what that number does, if there's a snorkeler or diver or even another fisherman that happens to see the shark or recapture the shark, they see the number, they see our number, um, our like contact information on the back of the tag and um, they'll contact us and that's how we'll figure out like where the shark has been going, uh, which direction it might be moving, um, figuring out like if there's seasonal patterns, the shark movement, things like that. So, so yeah, that's the type of information we get from the tagging. And all of this information is used for various types of research in our labs. Um, I know someone in my lab is doing the stable isotope research. So she's looking to see if there's a seasonal difference and shark feeding. So are they feeding on this type of prey during these months and then switching to different types of prey in different months? So pretty cool research. Let's see, more questions. So are sharks less, from Katie, are sharks less susceptible to microbes of a sick fish or animal that they eat? So I am not an expert on like the physical, the microbial health and like physical health of sharks, but they, but usually if something affects 
a mammal, a mammal, like a type of disease, it usually won't affect the shark because it's just a different type of, like a completely different type of um, system, like a blood circulatory system, like nervous system. It's just very different. So that microbe might not be able to live the same type of way in a shark as it does with another mammal. Um, and then heard that sharks don't get cancer. Is that true? I actually recently heard something and read something, I mean, um, that saying that sharks can get cancer, but it's not, it's not common in sharks, but it is something that they, they can get. So um, I can't remember exactly where that myth of sharks can't get cancer came from, um, but there are a lot of cancer fighting elements in their, um, like in their circulatory system and even in their bone as well, or in their cartilaginous bone. Um, so yeah, that's as much as I know on that topic. <laughs> but it is a myth that sharks don't get cancer. All right. So I'll answer the next question after I go over a little bit what I did in Belize. Um, so exactly a year ago, actually, I traveled to Belize to a little island called Key Calker. And I stayed there for two months looking at the effects of feeding tourism, uh, which is termed provisioning tourism, looked at that effect on their sharks there. So there is a specific area called Shark Ray Village in Key Cockford. And excuse me, and uh, fisher or not fisher, tour guides will bring their boats there, they'll bring tourists there, and they'll throw food in the water to uh, get the nurse sharks and the stingrays to come and you know feed and the tourists will get in the water and take pictures and it's a whole fun experience um so what i looked at was their behavior so i did a lot of video surveys and a lot of in-water surveys as you can see in um, this bottom picture right here um, i am just taking some tally marks and data on different types of behaviors that i was seeing underwater um, and I did have like volunteers helping me. So it wasn't just me by myself with like a bunch of sharks, so, <laughs> um, which actually probably would have been really cool. I would not have been, you know, mad about that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I looked at what change, what was causing any changes in behavior, what types of behavior um, were happening more often during certain feeding events. I also looked to see if they were uh, there's a word called habituated. So I looked to see if they were habituated to the boats in the area. Uh, and that just means if boats come to the area, are the sharks just uh, correlating the, the boats with food? Like, are they just coming out of nowhere and being like, oh, there's food here, it's a dinner bell. <laughs> um, short answer, yes, they were doing that. <laughs> and um, like I said, uh, I think what I was talking about, my favorite sharks and their sharks, and they actually became my favorite sharks after I did this research, just because they're very, um, like I said, they're like they're like puppies. Like they're just they're just so cute to me. <laughs> they're cute, and they just they're very um, what's the word? I just really like their coloring. They're also they've got like a sandy type uh, pattern on them. If you look really close to their skin, I think there might be a picture I have of. A close up of their uh, skin, but it's like a grainy color, and I just thought that was really pretty. Um, but yeah, so that's just some of the stuff I did in Belize. I um, also looked at behavior, habituation. I also looked to see if there were nurse sharks in any nearby reefs. So I compared the amount of nurse sharks that were in Shark Ray Village and looked to see if um, there were sharks in other areas, not directly close to the. Uh, Shark Ray Village, but just different reefs around Key Cocker, just to see if the area is being overused. Are all the nurse sharks coming to this area because there's a guarantee of food? Um, and basically, I saw like very minimal nurse sharks in other reefs around the island, uh, which is kind of suggesting that you know most of them are in this area, and it's probably because there's a very readily source of food uh, for them. So which isn't necessarily a bad thing, um, but just this type of research is really important because it's just important to know the effects that humans have on sharks in general. Because sharks are so important, like I said in previous slide, um, it's just always important for us to know what, how we're affecting these animals. 
All right, so let's get to these questions. So do nurse sharks have a good, or do sharks, sorry, have a good sense of smell? This is from Hannah. And are they really attracted to blood in the water? Yes, they are. They have an amazing sense of smell. Um, they also have, I thought I had it in my little, what is a shark, but I didn't. Uh, there's a picture right up under a shark's nose. You'll see all these little dots. And uh, those are called ampullae of Lorenzi. So it's actually a sensory organ. So it's kind of like a sixth, sixth sense for sharks. And it helps them, um, it helps them, what's the word? Uh, there we go. It helps them just to see electrical signals in the water, to feel electrical signals. So if there's a shark or a, a fish that's like really wigging out because it's just, maybe it got cut by something, maybe it's a fish that's thrown back in the water after it got caught, or maybe it's just in distress. <laughs> the sharks can actually feel those vibrations. Um, and that's what the ampullae of Lorenzi help. It helps them to detect those electrical signals given off by the muscles in the fish, um, which I think it's like a superpower <laughs> for sharks. They can literally see and sense some sharks. They can sense it more than others. Um, like for example, hammerhead sharks, they actually eat stingrays. So stingrays usually sit under the sand in the bottom so you can't see them. Uh, but hammerhead sharks, they'll, you'll see them literally like a metal detector. They're just going around looking for stingrays. And then you'll see he'll pin it down with his little hammer head or whatever, and he'll eat the stingray. And that's because they can sense where the stingray is under the water based on the um, electrical signals giving off, given off by the um, movement of the stingray or even like the heartbeat of the stingray. Um, so yeah, they are, they have superpowers. That's their superpower. <laughs> um, and then are they attracted to blood in the water? Um, they're attracted to fish blood. They're not attracted to human blood. So a common myth a lot of people think is if there's a drop of blood in the water, a shark's just gonna come out of nowhere and eat you or something like that. Um, sharks can't detect human blood because if you think about it, sharks were they sharks came before humans for one <laughs> and they did not prey on humans they preyed on things in the water so they really aren't um built to be able to smell or detect anything human blood related or even just anything yeah human blood they're not there's actually a video i would not recommend this at all but there's a video of a diver underwater and I think he like cuts himself a little and there's like a little blood in the water and there's the sharks everywhere, but they ignore him. Like it's, com they completely ignore him. Like I said, please don't do that. <laughs> I don't know why the diver did that in the video, but that video does prove <laughs> that sharks are not interested in human blood at all. So um, good question. And then, so Molly asks in my research, was there a core group of nurse sharks that you got to know individually? If yes, did you notice personality differences between individuals? That is a really good question. Um, so there was a nurse shark in uh, Shark Ray Village. He's the smallest nurse shark, probably about, uh, he was probably about two to three feet long, about a meter, less than a meter. I would say he's less than a meter. Um, and he had a little half moon cut on the back of his fin. Uh, and I named that Shark Carl because <laughs> He just the cutest shark there and um, you can definitely tell the sharks that are a little less experienced I guess in the area than the uh, older sharks the older and bigger sharks in the area so Carl was definitely always the last one to get food um, he he kind of stayed by himself a lot like he just was you know was, I'd always find him swimming by himself but Carl was the cutest little shark and um, there are a lot of animals, each animal is unique. A lot of people think, you know, sharks are just, all they do is eat, that's it. Um, but there are, um, they do have some intelligence and some personality difference. Like some sharks might prefer one thing over another thing. Um, but yeah, in Shark Ray Village, we definitely, you definitely can notice at least the sharks that have been there longer and the newer sharks. So the sharks that have been there longer, like if you see in this little gif that I have right here, um, the bigger sharks are on top and they're getting most of the food. Um, so, and, and the little sharks are usually sitting at the bottom, like you guys might be able to see at the bottom. Yeah, there's some sharks at the bottom, 
um, especially the stingrays. The stingrays were always kicked out of the way, but <laughs> um, the smaller sharks and the stingrays usually stayed at the bottom if they couldn't get any food at the top. So good question. Um, right, and then did I notice any negative effects? This question's from Rihanna. Did I notice any negative effects of tourism feeding on your shark? Yes, so the biggest negative effect that I could see was propeller wounds. So I don't think, let me go to my, you know, I don't have it here, but um, you know, I'll stay on this one. This is a really cool, you can see the sharks like eating the food and everything. It's a really good shot of them uh, eating. They're just so cute. Um, but yeah, so the negative effects that I saw was propeller marks on the fins of sharks. So I, yeah, there's no sharks in here that I can really point it out, but there are definitely some sharks that had uh, parts of their dorsal fin. So the one at the top, they were, it was missing, uh, missing some parts to them, uh, even on their back caudal fins, the big fins that they use to propel themselves. There were some cuts on there. Um, so those were the most, those were really the uh, blatant negative effects that I could see on the sharks. And this was also because if you look in the background of this GIF, you'll see how close they are to the uh, propeller of the, yeah, you can kind of see how close they are to the propeller of the uh, boats. And since to them, the boat engine noise signals food, the first place that they're going to really go is the back of the boat, because that's where the engine noise is coming from. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes those propellers were still spinning. And I didn't personally witness like sharks getting cut up by <laughs> boat propellers, but um, there's definitely evidence that since they're so close to the propellers and since I saw parts of their fins missing, there definitely is some uh, negative effects of them feeding so close to the uh, boats and things. So great question. All right, so I think at this point, yes, I am transitioning into sea turtles. And if you guys have any more questions about other things with sharks and sea turtles at the end, you definitely can. Um, oh, wait, there's another question about sharks. Here we go. <laughs> How many types of sharks are there? Okay, so fun fact, there's a new shark or ray species getting discovered about every couple of weeks. I think the statistic is like every two to three weeks, a new shark or ray is being discovered. Um, so as of now, I think there's around like four to 500 species of sharks. Um, there are a lot of different species of sharks and a lot of the newer species getting, um, a lot of the newer species getting uh, discovered are deep water species because in general we don't really know a ton about the deep ocean and there are a whole bunch of deep water sharks down there. So yeah, there's a lot of different species of sharks and each species of shark looks completely different. Like some of them look like aliens. I don't know if you've seen the goblin shark. They just look like something that should not be here on this earth. <laughs> uh, they kind of creep me out, but they're they're kind of cool, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's some, and like the cookie cutter shark, I, in my opinion, the cookie cutter shark, it's, it's probably about like this big, but it's the scariest shark to me. I would never want to be in the water with a cookie cutter shark because what they do is they literally will carve a chunk out of a whale or a shark or a dolphin, any like large animal. They'll just carve a chunk out of them and that's how they eat. Like, it doesn't matter if you're, they'll do that to humans too, actually. I've seen, I've read a um, story about someone in, I think it was in Hawaii. They were doing like a little night swim and they were trying to figure out what was like biting them. <laughs> and it was a cookie cutter shark that was just trying to like get a nice little chunk out of their leg or something. And yeah, no, I, so yeah, basically what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of different types of sharks. <laughs> And each shark is completely different. Like there's some alien sharks out there. If they're, if they, I'm pretty sure Shark Week is coming up in a couple of weeks. They might have the show um, Alien Sharks. That was, I think that's my favorite show from Shark Week in general. Um, and if you watch that show, you'll see there's a lot of sharks that look like they should not be here on this earth. <laughs> All right, so with that, I'm gonna go into some sea turtle stuff. <laughs> All right, so, um, I get the best of both worlds. I work with sharks and with sea turtles. So I'm a marine turtle specialist at Gumbo Limbo, uh, like I said a little earlier, and we're located in Boca Raton, Florida. It's, just, it's South Florida. Um, and what I do 
is I monitor beaches for <clears throat> the uh, for sea turtle nesting, which I'll go over in the next slide. Uh, and I also assist in the sea turtle hospital. So we have a rehabilitation hospital uh, where we re where our goal is to rescue, rehab, and release turtles um, that come into our hospital. These turtles can be anywhere from like a shark bite. They could have some infection that caused them to float, just be floating at the top of the water. Um, or the most common are really like boat strikes. So when turtles come up to breathe, it's very quick. And if boaters don't see it, you can easily run over that turtle and they'll get propeller wounds in their shell. Um, <clears throat> but a lot of people also like to ask, where do we find our turtles and how do we rescue our turtles? And the short answer is we don't go out and look for them. The public brings them to us. So we have a stranding hotline. So a phone number that's 24 hours. Um, if there's a sick or injured turtle that's seen, that number's called. And if it's easier for us to come get it, we'll come get the turtle. If it's easier for someone else to bring the turtle to us, we will take the turtle. Um, but yeah, so our goal is to give the turtle like meds that it needs. We do have a vet that comes and uh, looks at all of our turtles and then recommends medications and things like that. So yeah, it's a, I, that's like the very rewarding part of my job, especially um, with this loggerhead. This picture right here at the bottom is with the loggerhead. Her name was Euphorbia, uh, which is a type of flower. And she had a shark by injury, I believe on, on both flippers, but mo mainly on this flipper. Um, and this, someone asked if individual sharks have different personalities and 100% sea turtles have different personalities. It's actually kind of crazy. <laughs> and um, the, this turtle right here, her name was Euphorbia and she was in our rehab facility probably for about like almost six months trying to get her flipper back up to, um, back up to good use. We had all types of like gauze wrapped around, like uh, medications given to her, things like that. And I actually worked with this turtle a lot and um, she ended up becoming one of my really favorite turtles. That's why I got a picture with her. But she was a very hormonal mama. So she, was, she had an attitude. And I think that's why I really like this turtle. <laughs> she definitely had an attitude. She did not like it when I had to get in the tank with her and give her meds, she would grind her beak at me, which is actually kind of terrifying because um, specifically loggerheads, their, um, their name loggerhead is because they have gigantic heads and their, uh, their jaw muscles are probably about as big as a bicep muscle. So they're literally used to crush conch shells, crush through all types of things. So grinding beak from a loggerhead is not <laughs> not a good sign but i mean i had to give her meds so it is what it, she had to get over it but yeah so this turtle became one of my favorites just because of her attitude and um so yeah that turtles definitely have different personalities but yeah so if you can also look a little closely at this picture you'll see there's a satellite tag on euphorbia so we um usually do about four to five satellite tags on turtles a year and that's because uh, i think i said it a little earlier but satellite tags are very expensive um but we do like to tag certain turtles that we think might migrate to a certain area that's um that might be their foraging grounds. They might stay in certain areas to eat food for a long time. Um, and we can also just track to see in general how far these turtles swim. And sea turtles swim very, very, very long distances, um, hundreds and thousands of miles a year. And um, each species, you know, varies with how how much they um, how much they travel, but for the most part, most most sea turtles are migratory species. Um, and then I'll I'll get into the nesting, the cool nesting facts in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I also educate others on sea turtles and the threats they face. Whole lot of threats to sea turtles. Um, that like the things that I said before, uh, boat strikes. We also get a lot of entanglements. So turtles that are wrapped up in. Oh, I should have put the picture. But there's a turtle that came in about three months ago pre-COVID-19 and um, this turtle was probably about 40 pounds not even 40 pounds maybe like 20 pounds but this turtle had 35 pounds of monofilament like 
it literally looked like a whole laundry basket of netting on this turtle and it was entangled in it and it had just been floating for a couple it looked like it had been floating for probably about a month or so um, because she was very emaciated she wasn't eating uh she wasn't she did not have good like when we checked her blood and everything there was not good nutrients in her blood and it honestly might have even been more than 35 pounds of <laughs> netting but it was if if I remembered to put the picture on there, it basically, you couldn't even find the turtle. So that's how much uh, stuff was in that turtle. But that turtle was successfully rehabilitated. Um, but yeah, so those are just definitely big threats that sea turtles face and they're all human related. Fun fact. <laughs> um, so someone else asked, how much do the bigger turtles weigh? So I'll go into how much turtles weigh in the next slide when I go over, um, all the nesting facts and everything. Uh, and then someone asked, how much do satellite tags cost? They definitely cost um, thousands of dollars, <laughs> at least a thousand for one tag and five tags in a year, that's around like 5,000. So yeah, it's a lot of money. Um, so yeah, so sea turtles. Sea turtles are reptiles and I'll answer all of the nesting uh, questions at the end of this slide. So sea turtles are reptiles. For some reason, people like to think they're amphibians or even like some weird type of fish. I don't know, but they are definitely reptiles. Uh, they're basically living dinosaurs and they spend their entire lives in the water unless they're female, which means they're coming out of the water to nest. Male, if there's a male out of the water on the beach, there's something wrong. So <laughs> call us. Um, there's Overall in the world, there's seven, seven different types of sea turtles, uh, but the specific types that we get here in South Florida and uh, the types that I work with are the loggerhead, the first picture right here, green sea turtle, and then leatherback sea turtles, which are at the, um, is my like little chat box? Oh, there we go. Uh, leatherback sea turtles, which are uh, right here at the end. So I've actually never seen an adult leatherback um with the whole four years that i've been working here <laughs> there we don't in our specific beach the more south you get in florida the less uh, leatherbacks you're really going to see so there are more leatherbacks in the northern part of florida uh, but we do occasionally get about 15 to 20 nests a year from these guys so uh, we i only see the uh the hatchlings um so okay um so yeah the loggerhead sea turtles, like I said, they get their name from their gigantic heads. So they uh, eat conch shells, lobsters, shelly things, basically. If it's got a shell on it, the loggerhead wants it. <laughs> um, they're actually the smallest of the three types that we get. So they can get up to about 300 pounds, still like a nice size animal <laughs> to be the smallest out of these three. Uh, and then green sea turtles right here. Um, they have tiny, their little heads are just so funny compared to the loggerheads in my, they're just tiny little heads for their big body. Um, so they can get up to about 400 pounds and they are called green sea turtles, not because their color is green, because the inside of them is green. So their fat is green. And that's because they feed on like algae, seagrass, um, and because they eat so much of it, the inside of them's turned green. So that's why we get green sea turtles. And fun fact, green sea turtles were almost fished to extinction here in Florida because of the, um, there was a, people ate them a lot. It was like, I think it was a canning uh, industry for sea turtles. So like sea turtle soup, that was green sea turtles. Um, and yeah, so, but these guys are back on the rise. Their population is making a huge comeback. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, leatherback sea turtles are actually the largest sea turtle in the entire world, the largest type of turtle in general in the entire world. So they can get up to about 2,000 pounds, nine feet long and about six feet wide. So this is a massive animal that you're talking about like this. <laughs> and that's why I want to see a leatherback. I have to see a leatherback <laughs> because there's just dinosaurs. It's just like seeing a tractor rolled out of the water, um, just made a mess of the beach and then just rolls back in the water. Like it's, it's absolutely, absolutely insane. So these are just little leatherback hatchlings. They get the name leatherback because their uh, shells are actually not hard shells. They're not like if you 
knocked on a leatherback shell, it wouldn't make a noise because they're soft, leathery, flexible uh, material. And um, this is because they're deep water species. They're actually one of the deepest diving vertebrates in the entire world, like up to a mile or two underwater. Um, and if their shells were hard, that would crush under all the pressure of that deep water. But since their shells are leathery and flexible, it can like compress, decompress, things like that um, with no problem. And leatherback sea turtles, their entire diet is jellyfish. They only eat jellyfish, which is insane to me because they're such gigantic creatures. You know how much jellyfish that they have to eat? <laughs> Probably a lot. <laughs> um, there's actually some theories out there that just suggest that leatherbacks never stop eating. They just constantly eat. Um, yeah, so jellyfish to me seem like they're just made out of, I don't know, water and air. Like, I don't know what kind of nutrients you get from jellyfish, but they make it work. <laughs> um, all right, so Ben asks, has COVID-19 affected nesting numbers and um, seeing how there's less people on the beach? So, and do you think the mass return to the beach in the coming years will hurt nesting? All right, so that is a very good question. Uh, so the, when, there when the shutdowns happened and there was no one on the beach, personally, I loved it because I could just be on the beach by myself <laughs> looking at sea turtle nests, um, but, we did see less numbers of false crawls. So every time a sea turtle comes out of the ocean, it's not going to nest. Um, about 50% of the time they're gonna nest. So if there's someone on the beach shining lights or if there's like an animal on the beach or it's something that tells this turtle, you know what, we probably shouldn't nest here. She's gonna turn right back around and go back to the water, literally like a U-turn. So uh, we call those false crawls or non-nesting emergences. So we saw less of those because there were not many people on the beach and um, definitely more nesting. So it was not necessarily like more number of more numbers of nests than we've ever seen before, but just a higher ratio of nests to false crawls. Um, and then when people did start returning to the beach, we our uh, false crawl numbers definitely went up. Um, so we went back to our, I guess, normal false crawl to nest ratio. Um, and so yeah, that definitely had effect on the amount of false crawls that we had. So not this nesting season for us, uh, sea turtles, fun fact, they don't nest every single year. Since it's such a, um, like a physical tiring and they don't eat these entire months that they're uh, nesting. Oh, I probably should say sea turtle nesting season is from March till October here in South Florida, forgot to mention that before. Um, but that entire time they're not eating their whole, they just want to nest and be done because each nesting female will nest about like four to five, maybe even seven nests in one season. Um, and I'll talk about how many eggs are in the clutches and everything uh, in a little second. But yeah, so they, they nest every other year or every two or three years. So right now we are seeing we are in a low year. So most of our mamas that nested last year are probably not going to nest this year. So we're not expecting a big number of nests. So overall, um, we are seeing like a good number of nests to false, a normal number of nest to false crawl ratios since the uh, return of people back on the beaches. All right. So I'll answer this next question kind of as I go through. So how many times can a female, I said that, yep. How many times can a female lay a clutch of eggs? Um, so, so yeah, so those three species I just mentioned, they nest on the beach, they nest on our beaches in Boca. Um, and fun fact, sea turtles only nest when it's dark outside. So as soon as the sun goes down, up until the sun comes up, a turtle, can nest anytime between that time. So they have a 12 hour window to nest. Um, so in this first picture right here, uh, we usually take pre-COVID, we take uh, people out and we try and see a nesting sea turtle. So um, since these guys nest at night, we usually run programs from about nine to midnight. We only are uh, looking to see one nesting female, We're only allowed to see one nesting female. And if we do, this is what it looks like. So in this picture, you can see her clutch of eggs that she's dropping. Uh, so the female uses her back flippers to scoop sand out of the uh, area and kind of 
just they like literally scoop the sand, throw it, scoop the sand, throw it to get a nice little bulb, like a light bulb shape of uh, egg chamber. And sea turtles can lay up to like 150 eggs in a nest. Uh, there was a nest that I had to relocate because it was too close to the water. She had about 185 eggs in a nest. And I was just like, when are the eggs going to end? <laughs> but yeah, so since these turtles can lay that many eggs um, five to seven times in one season, that's a whole lot of babies that turtle is probably producing. Uh, and because of that, sea turtles lay their eggs and leave. They don't even recognize their children. They don't care about their little, little babies. So um, like mo a lot of reptiles, they usually just lay their eggs and let their babies fend for themselves. <laughs> but yeah, so the uh, uh, gestation period is about, or the incubation period is about um, one and a half, two months. So 45 to 55 days. And for leatherback sea turtles, though, it's 70 to 80 days because they're just a bigger animal and their eggs are bigger, so it takes longer for them to incubate and things like that. Um, but yeah, after that, they nest or they, uh, they hatch. There we go. Little babies come out of the sand and then they start hatching. Um, and I'll get a really cute video in the next slide of little babies run into the water. Um, but really quickly, this is a green sea turtle nest, the uh, picture on the right. So this turtle came up, she laid her eggs somewhere in here, and then she just threw a bunch of sand on top of her uh, nest to disguise it. So each sea turtle a nest is distinct. So each species does it a different way. Loggerheads are a lot more neat. Greens and leatherbacks kind of just make a complete mess of the beach just because. Um, but yeah, so that's a really unique between each species of how they nest. Um, and then someone might ask, I haven't looked at the questions yet, why are we using red lights on this turtle? So red is the first color to disappear underwater about 20 to 30 feet down. So sea turtles actually have not, they don't evolve to see that color. Um, so at night, if, you, if they're white lights, that's gonna scare them and probably also really hurt their eyes. So they're gonna probably abandon any attempt that they have at like trying to nest, they're just gonna go back to the water. So that's the thing that's gonna scare them. So we use red light because it's probably a very dull grayish color to them and it's not going to uh, affect them. Um, and also like once they actually start dropping eggs, nothing's really gonna stop them from dropping those eggs. They're not gonna be scared or anything. Well, they're gonna know that we're around, but she's in a trance that says, just drop those eggs, cover the sand and then leave. <laughs> So, but yeah, let me look at the questions real quick. Da, 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 da. How, far, how far north can sea turtles go in the ocean and how far north do sea turtles nest? So I'm pretty sure in like the Carolinas and uh, Virginia area is about as far north as sea turtles will go to nest. Um, sea turtles will migrate though all the way up to like Canada area, um, I think one of our sea turtles that we had tagged, I don't remember its name, but she went all the way up to like the, what is it called? Like the, just the Northeastern United States, very far away from Florida. <laughs> and um, leatherbacks in particular are extremely migratory and they can go like hundreds of thousands of miles, like in a year or two. And they'll go all the way up North and like Arctic waters, they can handle cold water and then um, they'll come all the way back down here to nest. So they can go pretty far north. Like I said, it depends on the species. Um, I don't believe green sea turtles are as migratory as leatherbacks and um, loggerheads. Um, but yeah, those two species definitely go way up north. Just probably to eat or something. I don't really know what they do up there, but <laughs> I don't know what's better than the South Florida sun. No. <laughs> Um, let's see, what ways do leatherback sea turtles protect and defend themselves? So usually animals that big really don't have a reason to defend themselves because nothing's gonna <laughs> attack them. Um, I don't know, if I was a shark and I saw a giant leatherback, I'd be like, you know, I'm good. I'm good, I'm not gonna try. <laughs> um, they're very fast swimmers. Sea tur people like to think sea turtles are, or turtles in general are very slow. Like get them in the water and they will be out of your eyesight within a second, <laughs> just from one little flip of their uh, fins or flippers, there we go. All right. Um, 
And then here's some pictures of little baby sea turtles going to the water. Um, these are leatherback sea turtles. So, or not leather, loggerheads. There we go. These are loggerhead uh, hatchlings and they either hatched, they, yeah, they hatched that morning and this is kind of the view that we get. <laughs> it's a really fun little view I get during my job sometimes. Um, and then here, there we go. So there are days where we'll, um, we call it excavating a nest. So after a nest hatches, three days later, we'll go in and inventory the nest. So we'll dig up the egg chamber, see how many eggs hatched, how many eggs might not have made it, like the embryo may have like just stopped developing in the egg. Um, and then sometimes there are these little live guys that like fell asleep in the bottom of the nest and we're just waiting for us to come and get them. Um, so what we do with those guys is later that night, will go out, take a bucket of them and release them. So sea turtles hatch only at night because that's when it's cooler out. Um, so their little, their little fins won't, or their little flippers won't get too hot in the hot sand during the day. So at night, that is when, uh, any time at night is when they hatch. There's no like specific, they hatch at 2 a.m. on the dot. <laughs> a lot of people like to ask like, oh, when do they hatch? Like if we come out at night trying to see them, like there's really no, specific time just that night so yeah once again we have a red light we're just releasing these little guys it looks like a mixture of leatherbacks and greens and loggerhead hatchlings i don't really know but <laughs> they're just really cute little things going go into the water it's really fun to see them <laughs> all right and then someone asked is there a way for tourists to responsibly interact with wild turtles or should we just stick to seeing them in aquariums I say if you live on the beach and you're very aware of uh, sea turtles, there's really nothing I can say to be like, don't go out on the beach and see a sea turtle. Like that's really, there's no way you can, that's not, that's not nice. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, so if you do live on the beach and you know sea turtles uh, nest there, there's hatching, always keep your distance with wild animals. Um, sea turtles are federally protected. So if you touch one, you can go to jail or get a very large fine. So it's very important for you to keep your distance. Um, if you have red lights, just make sure, or if you, even if you don't have red lights, usually beaches are pretty bright at night because of the water and um, like the moon reflecting off the water. And it's usually you can see pretty well, but um, just no lights at night. Um, and if you happen to see a sea turtle during the day, that means usually like the morning nesters will see are turtles that have just finished their nesting. They were just a little late and then <laughs> trying to get back to the water. So um, just keep your distance if you see sea turtles. And seeing sea turtles when you go diving or snorkeling is just, I think is really cool because you can just see all their cool colors and patterns on their shells. They're not like covered in sand or anything, um, but also keep your distance there, like no touching. I'm very anti-touching wildlife <laughs> in the wild and um, keep your distance and just be very respectful of their space because they're definitely way more scared of you than you are of them. So um, making sure you keep your distance is the best way for me to tell you to responsibly like interact with sea turtles. Um, let's see. Seeing them in aquariums are pretty cool too. <laughs> All right. So is it true that sand temperature dictates whether the turtle is male or female? Yes. So um, with sea turtles, hot sand gives you more females. Cold sand or cooler sand gives you uh, more males. So on our beaches in South Florida, what do you think we usually get? probably mostly for females because <laughs> our sand is hot and it just is getting hotter. Um, but yeah, there's actually a really cool study. We partner with Florida Atlantic University's Marine Science Lab and we help them with their sea turtle research by putting uh, data loggers, so their temperature loggers, right in the egg chamber of a nest. There's a whole process with that. We find egg chambers and then put the um, data logger in. So it's recording the nest temperature over the whole incubation period of the um, of the of the nest, and then once that nest hatches, we actually put a cage over the nest so that we can act, so we can catch all the little babies before they go in the water, um, and we bring them back to FAU and they try and figure out what sex the sea turtle is. So also with sea turtles, you can't tell between male or female until they are uh, completely sexually mature adults. 
and that is when they are 25 to 30 years old. So the only way to tell if a sea turtle is male or female before that time is to look inside at their little organs. So you go through their cloaca and you can look and see, um, or I think sometimes they make like just a tiny little incision like an endoscope and they uh, look and see what kind of organs that turtle has. And that's how they figure out if it's a male or a female. Um, so yeah, so here in Florida, the or here in Boca Raton beaches, the past, I think four or five years, we've had like 99 to 100% females uh, in our experimental nests. Now that is only about like, maybe like 10% of our overall, not even 10% actually of our overall uh, total nests. Um, but yeah, so that is alarming. So someone asked, are there worries that as climate change worsens, the ratios of sexes will be skewed? Yes, so that is a really big concern for us because each year our beaches are getting hotter um, and we are going through a lot more dry seasons than normal during the summer. So the rain usually helps cool the, uh, cool the sand off, things like that. Um, but yeah, so climate change is definitely having a effect on these guys just with, like I said, our sand is getting hotter and we're producing a whole lot more females, which is not really good for a population that depends on males to um, reproduce. <laughs> um, there are some talks of saying like, maybe this population will eventually like figure out how to just somehow reproduce with only females, something like that. But as of now, that is a big concern. Climate change affecting our uh, a higher female population. Very good questions. Um, I honestly think, okay, so that was all I really had on sea turtles and sharks. If you guys have more questions, definitely uh, ask and I'll be happy to answer. But I just wanted to go into an organization that I just co-founded um, called NIST, Minorities in Shark Science. And our goal is to increase the diversity in shark science and encourage more women of color into the shark sciences. So basically about, I don't even think it's been two months yet, about a month and a half-ish ago, uh, I've somehow found four other or three other black girls who are also in shark science. And the reason why that is so like absolutely crazy is because I've always been the only one. <laughs> so finding other black girl shark scientists was just absolutely mind-blowing and we all were just like oh my gosh let's start a club like we've got to start a club because <laughs> this is so exciting <laughs> and they shared my enthusiasm like we all were just like all right like we want to get more people that look like us into shark sciences and um we decided to create NIST. so we are doing a lot of outreach and a lot of fundraising so we've actually already hit our 25,000 fundraising goal for the year. And like I said, we only stopped, we, are, we only started about a month and a half ago. <laughs> so we got a whole lot of support and overwhelming amount of support, really. It was really pretty awesome. But um, we have workshops coming up next March and April, uh, where we're inviting women of color who are interested in marine or shark sciences um, for a weekend to get some hands-on experience in shark science and uh, learn some different things about marine science but out in the field so a big barrier to many minorities in shark science especially for me was uh, financial issues so in shark science and even marine science in general you have to pay for experience um, and I don't think that's pretty cool because a lot of people can't afford it and um, minorities specifically they're at some minorities are a very big disadvantage for that so our goal is well not our goal we're going to do this all the applicants uh along that are going to be on our workshop are not going to pay for anything so we're going to have their travel covered um, we'll have all their food and board covered everything like that is going to be completely covered because that was a big barrier in us for us um, during our um, experiences and coming up to where we are now. And we wanna remove that barrier for up and coming shark sciences or up and coming minorities in shark science. So, um, so yeah, this is something I'm really excited about. Uh, since we are still in our infancy, we just have like a lot of like big ideas and goals over the next couple of years. But overall, our mission is to increase and encourage more women of color to come into this uh, come into this field and 
just tell them like, you know, like you're welcome here. We are going to be a resource. We, um, we want to help you. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's my little spiel on this. <laughs> so also, I think Abby said she's going to put the uh, website and everything on the post. So feel free to go and check out like what we're doing. We're doing a lot of different um, uh, outreach as well. So if you go on our Instagram or our, uh, Twitter pages, they'll we have a lot more information of events and things coming up. So. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much, Carly, for talking about that a little bit. Um, there are just two more questions that I sent to you in the chat that I'll let, let you get to in a sec. Um, but like Carly said, I will be posting more information about the um, their new organization on our website and across our social medias and whatnot in case anybody is interested. And yeah, so I'll just let you kind of finish up with some of the questions. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So Ben said you've lived in Detroit and you've lived in Florida. Obviously, it is much easier to have a hands on impact on conservation of these species when you're close to the ocean. What is the best way us folks up north and in other landlocked states can help out with conservation? That is a wonderful question. Yes, I was definitely landlocked in Detroit and was like, how can I help with conservation? Um, so a big thing is doing your own research on a lot of different issues and um, making sure like following, like for me, I think social media is a really big educational and outreach thing. Um, so just becoming more aware of certain issues that are going on. And also currently like, there's a lot of primary elections going out, voting. So voting for um, officials that have conservation in mind and um, also doing some research on different, uh, what is it called? I just different laws going into effect that are specifically affecting our oceans. Like recently there have been a lot of different laws signed into place that are either, some are helping and some are not helping our oceans at all. So I do encourage you all to do research on that to see different ways you can vote to help with conservation. Um, and also like donating to different nonprofits that, uh, that are, um, what is it, that are dedicated to conservation and helping, um, you know, just doing a lot of different research in our oceans that could help, uh, you know, move forward with a lot of different conservation laws and things like that. Um, so donating because there's really not a whole lot of money in <laughs> marine science and conservation in general um, compared to a lot of different areas just in the world and uh, donating definitely helps. Um, and then if there's an aquarium or something near you, like just going to the aquarium all the time. Like I, I loved the aquarium growing up. <laughs> there weren't like sharks and everything in some aquariums in Detroit, but like I traveled a lot as well. Like my parents took me places and, um, you know, going to aquariums, even in Georgia, like in Tennessee, I think I went to aquariums in Tennessee and it just helps you get more of a um, feel and uh, what is it more of a, I think it sparks your passion for a lot of conservation. Cause you're like, I see these animals right in front of me. They're amazing, but out in the ocean, like they're struggling. <laughs> So just going to aquarium, becoming a whole lot more educated and um, doing your own research and donating to a lot of different organizations will definitely, uh, definitely ways you can help out with conservation. And also like little things like recycling. <laughs> it's a sim simple little thing like recycling, making sure you reduce your single use plastic because that's a big issue uh, with sea turtles we get. Um, fun fact, every single sea turtle that we get into our rehab facility has plastic in its stomach. Um, there's absolutely no way we can really get around that because there's plastic in our oceans. And really the way to uh, help combat that is to recycle and make sure you're reducing single use plastics. Um, unfortunately, the world kind of makes it easier to just use plastic and throw it away. It's easy. <laughs> you don't have to wash it. I don't like doing dishes either. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, so just you know, like the straw thing that was going around and making, bringing your own like cutlery or uh, like making sure you're always using like metal utensils, things like that. Um, definitely are big, big things to help out conservation. Um, and another question from Steve, do you think there'll be range extensions to more Northern regions with climate change? Um, I don't know if you're talking about sharks or turtles, but with turtles, we are seeing kind of like a shift north 
for, excuse me, for a lot of different species, like especially the leatherback, um, they do tend to enjoy like cooler waters. So they do like to nest a little bit more north and sometimes we do see a little shift and uh, there's a lot of different factors that go into that shift as well, but climate change is one uh, aspect of it. Uh, and with sharks, I'm not 100% familiar on a lot of different movement ecology or uh, migration patterns of sharks, but I do remember seeing some uh, research that's been done that sees like just the northern shift of some uh, warmer water species. So the water might be getting a little too warm for these species. So they're just kind of moving a little bit more northern than they usually would uh, to look for their food and things like that. So. All right, and we definitely went a little bit over time. So Carly, I Oh really my gosh, did we? Oh, I didn't <laughs> it, even notice. It's okay, I, I didn't want to stop you. You're on a roll. And so I really appreciate you spending all, the, all your morning with us. Um, no for problem. everybody, uh, you know, start today. Uh, check out Carly and her, and her co-founder's website. Uh, start donating to conservation efforts today. And if you have any additional questions, you can feel free to send them to myself. Um, you can contact Carly by becoming a member on their website. Um, so lots to get involved with and start today. I appreciate everyone who has been watching and sending in their questions. We will be back next week with our how to dig up a dino paleontology presentation. So I hope to see you all back then. And Carly, thank you again. No problem. I had so much fun. Thank you guys for your good questions. <laughs>